Chapter Four of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Six, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Four: Mediation Declined. After the failure of his overture for joint mediation, and after the unqualified utterances of the United States against such measures, it might seem singular that the Emperor of the French should not have recognized the uselessness of similar attempts. Mr. Seward, after the rejection of the French overtures by England and Russia, treated the matter in a brief and dignified note to Mr. Dayton, in which he declined to discuss the subject at any length such a debate upon a subject which has already lost its practical character or which to speak more accurately has not attained such a character may produce irritations and jealousies which the president desires to avoid yet at the risk of exciting just such irritations and jealousies the emperor again sought to approach the government of the united states alone with a message which he had already been informed would have been rejected if brought by all the great powers of europe jointly Drouin de la Hue addressed a dispatch to M. Mercier, the French minister in Washington, on the ninth of January, 1863, in which, while he refers to the little success of former overtures, he says that the government of the emperor has seriously examined the objections which have been made to us when we have suggested the idea of a friendly mediation, and we have asked ourselves whether they are truly of a nature to set aside as premature every tentative to a reconciliation he was not aware of the repugnance of the united states to an intervention of foreign powers nor of the hope which as he says the federal government has not abandoned of obtaining a solution by force of arms but amid all the courteous forms in which his expression is wrapped it is evident he thinks that repugnance is unreasonable and that hope fallacious he reminded the government of the united states of the conferences which preceded the acknowledgment of their independence by great britain and continued in a paragraph which we will give without abridgment to set forth a proposition which was little less than that of the surrender of the national authority nothing therefore would hinder the government of the united states without renouncing the advantage which it believes it can attain by the continuation of the war from entering upon informal conferences with the confederates of the south in case they should show themselves disposed thereto representatives or commissioners of the two parties could assemble at such point as it should be deemed proper to designate and which could for this purpose be declared neutral reciprocal complaints would be examined into at this meeting in place of the accusations which north and south mutually cast upon each other at this time would be substituted an argumentative discussion of the interests which divide them they would seek out by means of well-ordered and profound deliberations whether these interests are definitely irreconcilable whether separation is an extreme which can no longer be avoided or whether the memories of a common existence whether the ties of every kind which have made of the north and of the south one sole and whole federative state and have borne them on to such a high degree of prosperity are not more powerful than the causes which have placed arms in the hands of the two populations a negotiation the object of which would be thus determinate would not involve any of the objections raised against the diplomatic intervention of europe and without giving birth to the same hopes as the intermediate conclusion of an armistice would exercise a happy influence on the march of events this overture of mediation was received on the third of february and was answered by mr seward under the president's instructions only three days later it was a dark period of the war between fredericksburg and chancellorsville there was much in the attitude of veiled hostility of european powers to discourage and depress but the statesmen charged with the welfare of the republic met this insidious attack as they met all others with unshakable courage and fortitude the reply of Mr. Seward to the French overture of mediation was one of the most important state papers written during the war. He referred in the beginning to the language used by Durand de Hoy in regard to the protraction of the struggle and the hopes of the federal government. 
these passages he says seem to me to do unintentional injustice to the language whether confidential or public in which the government has constantly spoken on the subject of the war it certainly has had and avowed only one purpose a determination to preserve the integrity of the country so far from admitting any laxity of effort or betraying any despondency the government has on the contrary borne itself cheerfully in all vicissitudes with unwavering confidence in an early and complete triumph of the national cause now when we are in a manner invited by a friendly power to review the twenty-one months history of the conflict we find no occasion to abate that confidence through such an altercation of victories and defeats as is the appointed incident of every war the land and naval forces of the united states have steadily advanced reclaiming from the insurgents the ports forts and posts which they had treacherously seized before strife actually began and even before it was seriously apprehended so many of the states and districts which the insurgents included in the field of their projected exclusive slaveholding dominions have already been re-established under the flag of the union that they now retain only the states of georgia alabama and texas with half of virginia half of north carolina and two-thirds of south carolina half of mississippi and one-third respectively of arkansas and louisiana the national forces hold even this small territory in close blockade and siege this government if required does not hesitate to submit its achievements to the test of comparison and it maintains that in no part of the world and in no times ancient or modern has a nation when rendered all unready for combat by the enjoyment of eighty years of almost unbroken peace so quickly awakened at the alarm of sedition put forth energies so vigorous and achieved successes so signal and effective as those which have marked the progress of this contest on the part of the union mr seward then goes on to say that he fears m durand de la hue has taken other light than the correspondence of this government for his guidance in ascertaining its temper and firmness he has been misled by the freedom of opposition and criticism allowed by our laws and customs but he reminds him that not one voice has been raised anywhere out of the immediate field of the insurrection in favor of foreign intervention of mediation of arbitration or of compromise with the relinquishment of one acre of the national domain or the surrender of even one constitutional franchise at the same time it is manifest to the world that our resources are yet abundant and our credit adequate to the exacting emergency in answer to durand de la hue's suggestion that the government shall appoint commissioners to meet on neutral ground commissioners of the insurgents and to arrange with them a basis of agreement he says that this amounts to nothing less than a proposition that while this government is engaged in suppressing an armed insurrection with the purpose of maintaining the constitutional national authority and preserving the integrity of the country it shall enter into diplomatic discussions with the insurgents upon questions whether that authority shall not be renounced and whether the country shall not be delivered over to disunion to be quickly followed by an ever-increasing anarchy mr seward replied that even if it were possible for the government of the united states to compromise the national authority so far as to enter into any such debates no good results could flow from them the insurgent leaders would never consent to forego the ambition that has impelled them to the disloyal position they are occupying the loyal people of the south would be unheard in any such discussion and any offer of peace by the government on the condition of the maintenance of the union must necessarily be rejected on the other hand as i have already intimated this government has not the least thought of relinquishing the trust which has been confided to it by the nation under the most solemn of all political sanctions and if it had any such thought it would still have abundant reasons to know that peace proposed at the cost of dissolution would be immediately unreservedly and indignantly rejected by the american people it is a great mistake that european statesmen make if they suppose this people are demoralized whatever in the case of an insurrection the people of france or of great britain or of switzerland or of the netherlands would do to save their national existence no matter how the strife might be regarded by 
or might affect foreign nations just so much and certainly no less the people of the united states will do if necessary to save for the common benefit the region which is bounded by the pacific and the atlantic coasts and by the shores of the gulf of st lawrence and mexico together with the free and common navigation of the natural highways by which this land which to them is at once a land of inheritance and a land of promise is opened and watered even if the agents of the american people now exercising their power should through fear or faction fall below this height of the national virtue they would be speedily yet constitutionally replaced by others of sterner character and patriotism mr seward objects to the use of the phrase north and south to describe the parties in conflict there is an insurrectionary party confined to a restricted region while the loyal people embrace not only northern states but also eastern middle western and southern states in reply to Durand de la hue's citation of the conferences that preceded the peace between the colonies and great britain he says that action in the crisis of a nation must accord with its necessities great britain when entering on negotiations had manifestly come to entertain doubts of her ultimate success and it is certain that the councils of the colonies could not fail to take new courage if not to gain other advantages when the parent state compromised so far as to treat of peace on the terms of conceding their independence it is true indeed that peace must come at some time and that conferences must attend if they are not allowed to proceed the pacification there is however a better form for such conferences than the one which m durand de la hue suggests the latter would be palpably in derogation of the constitution of the united states and would carry no weight because destitute of the sanction necessary to bind either the disloyal or the loyal portions of the people on the other hand the congress of the united states furnishes a constitutional form for debates between the alienated parties senators and representatives from the loyal portion of the people are there already fully empowered to confer and seats also are vacant and inviting senators and representatives of the discontented party who may be constitutionally sent there from the states involved in the insurrection moreover the conferences which can thus be held in congress have this great advantage over any that could be organized upon the plan of m durand de la Hues, namely that the congress if it were thought wise could call a national convention to adopt its recommendations and give them all the solemnity and binding force of organic law such conferences between the alienated parties may be said to have already begun maryland virginia kentucky tennessee and missouri states which are claimed by the insurgents are already represented in congress and submitting with perfect freedom and in a proper spirit their advice upon the course best calculated to bring about in the shortest time a firm lasting and honorable peace representatives have been also sent from louisiana and others are understood to be coming from arkansas there is a preponderating argument mr seward said in concluding this unanswerable dispatch in favor of the congressional form of conference over that which is suggested by m durand de la Hues, namely that while an accession to the latter would bring this government into a concurrence with the insurgents in disregarding and setting aside an important part of the constitution of the united states and so would be a pernicious example the congressional conference on the contrary preserves and gives new strength to that sacred writing which must continue through future ages the sheet anchor of the republic we find in the manuscript archives of the confederate department of state some curious facts which go far to explain the apparently stupid persistence of the emperor of france in this scheme of mediation mr slittle gives an account of a long and intimate conversation with the emperor held on the sixteenth of july eighteen sixty two in which the emperor spoke with great satisfaction of the defeat of mcclellan before richmond and of mr lincoln's call for additional troops as evidence of his conviction of the desperate character of the struggle in which he was engaged the emperor said that although it was unquestionably for the interests of france that the united states should be a powerful and united people to act as contrepods to the maritime power of england yet his sympathies had always been with the south 
whose people were struggling for the principle of self-government, of which he was a firm and consistent advocate. That he had always considered the re-establishment of the Union impossible, and final separation a mere question of time, but the difficulty was to find a way to give effect to his sympathies, that in so grave a question he had not been willing to act without the cooperation of England, which he had not as yet been able to secure. He thought England wished him to draw the chestnuts from the fire. Mr. Slittle, in a strong plea in favor of the recognition of the Confederacy by France, said that it would be the safest and most efficacious means of establishing the independence of the South. He played, with great skill, upon the Emperor's special weaknesses, assuring him that England would follow wherever he led, that the United States had no naval power which could stand for a moment against his ironclad ships, that the safety of Maximilian in Mexico depended upon the triumph of the South, and at length, appealing directly to his cupidity, he offered him a large pecuniary inducement, either to break the blockade or to recognize the Confederacy at his choice. Mr. Slittle had been authorized by a confidential dispatch from Mr. Benjamin to make this astonishing proposition. With an instinctive conviction that an appeal to the most sordid motives would be more likely to be favorably received at Tuileries than in Downing Street, the Confederate government ordered Mr. Slittle to sound the Emperor to ascertain whether he was so bound up by his engagements with England as to be entirely precluded from independent action. In the exceptional position which we now occupy, said Mr. Benjamin, struggling for existence against an enemy whose vastly superior resources for obtaining the material of war place us at great disadvantage, it becomes of primary importance to neglect no means of opening our ports. It is well understood, he went on to say, that there exists at present a temporary embarrassment in the finances of France, which might have the effect of deterring that government from initiating a policy likely to superinduce the necessity for naval expeditions. If under these circumstances you should, after cautious inquiry, be able to satisfy yourself that the grant of a subsidy for defraying the expenses of such expeditions would suffice for removing any obstacles to an arrangement or understanding with the Emperor, you are at liberty to enter into engagements to that effect. In such event the agreement would take the form most advantageous to this country, by stipulation to deliver on this side a certain number of bales of cotton to be received by the merchant vessels of France at certain designated points. In this manner, 100,000 bales of cotton at 500 pounds each, costing this government but $4,500,000, would represent a grant to France of not less than $12,500,000, or 63 million francs. Such sum would maintain afloat a considerable fleet for a length of time quite sufficient to open the Atlantic and Gulf ports to the commerce of France. He authorized Slittle further to couple with this proposition, for a direct subsidy, the free importation of goods to be brought into the Confederacy by the vessels which were to take the cotton to Europe. He estimated that the profits of those cargoes and the proceeds of the cotton altogether would scarcely fall short of one hundred million francs. Excited by the contemplation of these ciphers almost to the point of intoxication, Judah P. Benjamin proceeds. On this basis you will readily perceive the extent to which the finances of France might find immediate and permanent relief if the subsidy were doubled, and the enormous advantage which would accrue to that government if, by thus opening one or more of the southern ports to its own commerce, the interchange of commodities should absorb half a million or a million of bales. This proposition, Mr. Slittle, says the Emperor received in a manner which showed that it was not disagreeable to him. He asked some questions as to how the cotton was to be obtained, to which Mr. Slittle, of course, replied that His Majesty could manage that with his fleet. Mr. Benjamin had expressly authorized Mr. Slittle to use, in his discretion, the same means to procure the recognition of the Confederacy which he was empowered to use to induce France to raise the blockade. It is hardly to be doubted that the representations of the Confederate envoy had more or less effect on the mind of the Emperor in bringing about the decision to which he came in the autumn of attempting to organize his joint overture for peace to the United States. Mr. Slittle had another long and important conversation with the Emperor on the 28th of October. 
the interview was marked with the same expression of mutual sympathy as the preceding one mr slittle was confident of early and important confederate victories of disaffection and counter-revolution in the north the emperor again had no scruple in declaring that his sympathies were entirely with the south but that he was obliged to act with great caution and intimated that if he acted alone england instead of following his example would endeavor to embroil him with the united states and that french commerce would thus be destroyed mr slittle tried to convince him that recognition on his part would be absolutely safe that the american navy would be swept from the ocean and the northern ports blockaded by a moiety of the french marine that the glory or the normandy could enter the harbors of new york or boston and lay these cities under contribution that mad and stupid as the washington government had shown itself to be it still had sense enough not to seek a quarrel with the first power of the world the emperor then asked mr slittle what he thought of a joint mediation from france england and russia whether it would if proposed be accepted by the two parties mr slittle told him that the north would probably accept it but he could not venture to say how it would be received at richmond mr slittle intimating his belief that england would not join in such an overture the emperor said he had reason to suppose the contrary that he had a letter from the king of the belgians which he would show me he did so it was an autograph letter from king leopold to the emperor dated brussels fifteenth october the date is important as queen victoria was then at brussels the king urges in the warmest manner for the cause of humanity and in the interests of the suffering populations of europe that prompt and strenuous efforts should be made by france england and russia to put an end to the bloody war that now desolates america he expresses his perfect conviction that all attempts to reconstruct the union of the united states are hopeless that final separation is an accomplished fact and that it is the duty of the great powers so to treat it that recognition or any other course that might be thought best calculated to bring about a peace should be at once adopted the appeal is made with great earnestness to the emperor to bring the whole weight of his great name and authority to bear on the most important question of his day it is universally believed that king leopold's counsels have more influence with queen victoria than those of any living man that in this respect he has inherited the succession of the late prince consort whether it be that this interview fixed the wandering mind of the emperor or whether he was amusing himself by getting the opinion of mr slittle in relation to a matter already determined it is at all events noteworthy that his proposition to the courts of england and russia for the mediation of the affairs in the united states was dated on the thirtieth of october two days after this conversation it was in this same interview that the emperor proposed that mr slittle should build ships for the confederate navy in france and mr slittle in turn offered the emperor on behalf of the confederacy all possible assistance in mexico and to the west indies he might take as many islands and provinces as he liked a modified temptation of the mountain it is the common lot of traitors to suffer from treachery yet both parties to this interview doubtless felt afterwards that they had reason to complain of the way they were treated and mr slittle when the emperor repudiated his professions made in this interview probably felt no keener pang of confidence betrayed then did the emperor himself when in spite of the assurances of his royal brother of belgium the courts of england and russia flatly refused to join in his mission of mediation and in spite of the opinion of his louisiana friend that the north was really anxious for foreign intervention he received from mr lincoln a rebuff as galling as it was courteous and dignified this ended the discussion of the mediation of foreign powers in our affairs as between our government and those of the european states there was in fact no common ground between them the cabinets of the old world approached the subject with the conviction that the restoration of the national authority was impossible a hypothesis which mr lincoln and mr seward never permitted for a moment to find entrance into their hearts or minds it was alike repugnant to their feelings and their reason and the course of events gave a full justification to their courage and their wisdom it is after all not greatly to be wondered at that the european courts should have been deceived in regard to the attitude of the government of the united states 
and the prospect of its success in the contest with the rebellion. The French minister in Washington, M. Messier, a diplomatist of ability and experience, was personally so devoted an adherent of Napoleon III that his only point of view of public matters was in reference to their effect upon the fortunes or the plans of the emperor. He was not unaware that the complete triumph of the national arms was regarded in Paris as a contingency grossly improbable, and also, if it could be accomplished, unfavorable to the perpetuity of a Latin empire on this continent. His sympathies, and with them his beliefs, were therefore wholly on the side of the South. His intimate associations in this country were either with secessionists or with the most pronounced members of the opposition, whose sentiments were hardly to be distinguished from those of the insurgents. He naturally reported what he heard and what he believed, and what he thought would be agreeable to the emperor, and it would have been strange indeed if the latter had not been misled. An incident which happened in the latter part of 1862 had a tendency to confirm his impression that the national government was losing its confidence and its firmness, and that the Republican Party was not so united in its support as appeared on the surface. Horace Greeley, personally and by letter, approached him with a suggestion that he should secure the mediation of the French government to put an end to the war. M. Mercier, having no personal acquaintance with Mr. Greeley, knew nothing of those peculiarities of caprice and impulse which form the special weakness of that remarkable character. He saw in him only the most prominent and most powerful of American journalists, and took it for granted that he represented in his anxiety for peace, if not the administration itself, at least the Republican Party of New York. He communicated the letter to his colleagues as a matter of grave importance, symptomatic of the weakness of the radical war party of the North. He was greatly surprised by the severe admonition which he received from Mr. Seward for his share in the affair, and doubtless thought that the journalist more honestly represented the prevailing opinion than the premier. He made a journey to Richmond by the order of his government, and he gave so warm a coloring to the permission accorded to his journey by the federal government in his report of the transaction, that Mr. Seward thought proper to say in a letter to the Senate that he had never given a foreign minister or anybody else authority to make representations of any sort to the rebel government. A letter written by Lord Lyons, the British minister, to his government in the autumn of 1862 shows how hostile to the administration of Mr. Lincoln was the tone of feeling in the diplomatic body at that time, and how persistently European cabinets were misinformed by their representatives in Washington in reference to the situation and prospect of affairs in the United States. On his arrival in New York, after a visit to England, he had been met, and at once taken possession of, by the leaders of the Peace Party, who were also, at that time, among the leaders in fashionable society in New York. He apparently adopts their point of view in some respects, but sees the folly and doubts the sincerity of their pretenses that an armistice, which they ardently desire, would result in a restoration of the Union. The more sagacious members of the party, he says, must look upon the proposal of a convention merely as a last experiment to test the possibility of reunion. They are no doubt well aware that the most probable consequences of an armistice would be the establishment of Southern independence, but they perceive that if the South is so utterly alienated that no possible concession will induce it to return voluntarily to the Union, it is wiser to agree a separation than to prosecute a cruel and hopeless war. Singularly enough, Lord Lyons's conferences with the opposition in New York, whose advice was given in a sense hostile to the government and to the prosecution of the war, resulted in a report unfavorable to the project of mediation, which was being so earnestly pressed by the enemies of the national cause in Paris. He quoted the conservative leaders as saying that an offer of mediation, if made, to the radical administration would be rejected and that it might increase the virulence with which the war was prosecuted. If their own party were in power, or virtually controlled the administration, they would rather, if possible, obtain an armistice without the aid of foreign governments. They were especially timid about the political effect of an offer of mediation which should come from Great Britain. Lord Lyons therefore advised against such an offer on the ground that, 
it might embarrass the peace party and thus oblige them in order to maintain their popularity to make some declaration against it it is not the least significant feature of this curious letter that lord lyons says at washington i have had fewer opportunities than i had at new york of ascertaining the present views of the chiefs of political parties at the interviews he had on arriving with mr seward and the president they both conversed only on ordinary topics and did not appear to expect or to desire from him any special communications from her majesty's government he missed in the responsible rulers of the nation and in the executive and legislative functionaries in whose hands rested the welfare of the country that open and effusive freedom of communication which he found among the sympathizers with succession in the drawing-rooms of new york in advising his government against an offer of mediation he repeated and adopted as his own the opinion he gained among the conservatives of new york that the president had thrown himself into the arms of the extreme radical party his statement of the aims of that party was not altogether inaccurate they declare that there is no hope of reconciliation with the southern people that the war must be pursued per fas et nefas until the disloyal men of the south are ruined and subjugated if not exterminated that not an inch of the old territory of the republic must be given up and that the foreign intervention in any shape must be rejected and resented lord lyons had no right to say that there was no hope of reconciliation with the southern people it was the southern leaders of the rebellion alone who were regarded by mr lincoln as irreconcilable and it was a gratuitous insult to the government to which he was accredited to say that they were determined to pursue the war per fas et nefas his imputation to the president of revengeful purposes towards the disloyal is false and unjustifiable with these exceptions his statement may pass as sufficiently expressing the intention of the government to save the union intact and to continue the war to triumph of the national cause lord lyons indicates that he has no faith whatever in such an issue of the conflict if he was wrong in his opinion he was also inexcusably wrong in the assumed facts on which it was based for he informs his government that on the fourth of next march the democrats will obtain control of the new house of representatives that the new congress will be hostile to the administration and to the radical party and that the president will hardly be able to persist in his present policy and in his assumption of extraordinary powers ten minutes perusal of a newspaper containing a list of congressmen elect would have enabled him to avoid so flagrant an error but any lesser lapses seem pardonable in comparison with the stupendous error of a minister charged with the most solemn responsibilities between two great and friendly powers and possessed of unlimited faculties for ascertaining the truth saying as lord lyons says near the close of his letter all hope of the reconciliation of the union appears to be fading away even from the minds of those who most desire it from the beginning of the war the executive department of the government had in a thousand ways continually repeated its determination to listen to no overtures from the insurgents not based upon a recognition of the national authority and no overtures from foreign powers of any nature whatever having reference to the rebellion and just before the succession ended it was thought by congress proper that the legislative body should express itself on the subject with equal clearness resolutions were introduced and passed through both houses of congress by very large majorities acknowledging the friendly form and intention of the overtures made by foreign powers in the direction of mediation and saying that if the idea of mediation should continue to be regarded as practicable it might lead to proceedings tending to embarrass the friendly relations between the united states and foreign powers and that to remove for the future all chance of misunderstanding on the subject it seems fit that congress should declare its convictions thereon the resolutions following this preamble were at once a declaration of the attitude of the united states and a formal warning to all foreign powers that their intervention was not desired and would not be entertained they expressed the deep regret of the american people that the blow aimed by the rebellion at the national life has fallen so heavily upon the laboring population of europe but that any proposition from any foreign power having for its object the arrest of the efforts of the united states to suppress the rebellion is calculated to prolong and embitter the conflict to cause increased expenditure of blood and treasure and to postpone the much-desired day of peace 
and that Congress would look upon any further attempt in the same direction as an unfriendly act. The resolutions further expressed the disappointment of Congress at the hospitality and encouragement which a rebellious government, founded upon slavery as its cornerstone, had received from foreign powers, and they closed with the announcement that the war would be vigorously prosecuted according to the humane principles of Christian states until the rebellion should be suppressed. The President was requested to transmit a copy of these resolutions to the ministers of the United States in foreign countries, to be by them communicated to the governments to which they were accredited. End of chapter 4chapter five of abraham lincoln a history volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume six by john hay and john george nicolay chapter five signs of the times before enough time had elapsed to judge of the probable effect of lincoln's offer of compensation to the border states a new incident occurred which further complicated the president's dealings with the slavery question about the middle of may he was surprised to learn from the newspapers that general david hunter whom he had recently sent to command the department of the south had issued an order of military emancipation reciting that the department of the south was under martial law the order declared slavery and martial law in a free country are altogether incompatible the persons in these three states georgia florida and south carolina heretofore held as slaves are therefore declared forever free so far as can be judged general hunter was moved to this step by what seemed to him the requirements of his new surroundings and the simple dictates of natural justice he was a warm personal and political friend of president lincoln was entirely free from motives of selfish ambition and was not a man who would suffer himself to be made the instrument of a political combination of strong anti-slavery convictions his sense of duty in the service of the union was as single-hearted and as sacred as that of a crusader sent to rescue the holy sepulchre from the infidel in his eyes rebellion and slavery were intertwined abominations to be struck and conquered simultaneously when he took command of the department of the south he found himself surrounded by new conditions the capture of port royal in the preceding november had been followed by the flight of the whole white population leaving the entire coast from north edisto river to warsaw sound a distance of sixty or seventy miles in the hands of the captors this was the region of the famous sea island cotton plantations in which the slaves outnumbered the whites nearly five to one in their sudden flight the whites were compelled to abandon their slaves and a large negro population thus fell gradually to the care and protection of the union army the exercise of common humanity forced the military administration of the department beyond mere warlike objects the commander general thomas w sherman issued an address to the white inhabitants inviting them to return and reoccupy their lands and homes and continue their peaceful vocations under the auspices and protection of the government of the united states except in a very few instances the friendly invitation was defiantly refused they not only preferred ruin and exile but did such mischief as lay in their power by ordering their cotton to be burned and circulating among the blacks the statement that the yankees would seize them and sell them into slavery in cuba such was the distrust excited by the falsehood that a month after the capture of port royal but about three hundred and twenty blacks had ventured into sherman's camps nearly all these were decrepit or were women and children there being only sixty able-bodied men among them 
for a while the slaves made the most of their abrupt holiday but their scanty clothing wore out the small stock of provisions on the plantations became exhausted at the time of their master's flight much of the cotton crop was still in the fields in the increasing demand for this product it became an object for the government to collect and preserve what was left and this work begun under the joint orders of the war and treasury departments set on foot the first organization of the colored population for labor and government military orders divided the country into districts with agents to superintend the plantations to enroll and organize the blacks into working parties to furnish them necessary food and clothing and to pay them for their labor private philanthropy also gave timely and valuable assistance relief societies organized in boston new york and philadelphia collected funds and employed teachers some fifty of whom reached beaufort the ninth of march eighteen sixty two and began a much-needed work of combined encouragement guardianship and instruction thus replacing the elements of social government which the slaves had lost by the withdrawal of their masters and mistresses the control of the captured and abandoned cotton and other property fell to the treasury department and in this connection secretary chase at the president's request gave the educational enterprise his official sanction and supervision later on the war department assumed and continued the work compelled from the first to rely upon contrabands for information and assistance and to a large extent for military labor it gave them in return not only wages for the actual service performed but necessary food and shelter for the destitute and with the return of the spring season furnished them so far as possible seed and implements of husbandry and encouraged them to renew their accustomed labor in the gardens and fields of the abandoned plantations in order to provide for or at least contribute to their own maintenance under this treatment confidence was quickly established meanwhile by the military occupation of additional territory the number of blacks within the union lines had increased in two months from three hundred and twenty to over nine thousand when general hunter took command of the department of the south this industrial and educational organization of the blacks was just beginning military usefulness was of the first importance in his eyes particularly as his forces were insufficient for offensive movements it was not unnatural that seeing the large colored population within his lines much of it unemployed his thoughts should turn to the idea of organizing arming and training regiments of colored soldiers and assuming that the instructions of the war department conferred the necessary authority he began the experiment without delay it was amid all these conditions which at that time did not exist elsewhere that general hunter issued the already recited order announcing that slavery and martial law were incompatible and declaring free all slaves in his department the presence of the union army had visibly created a new order of things and he doubtless felt it a duty to proclaim officially what practically had come to pass the mails from the department of the south could only come by sea hence a week elapsed after the promulgation of hunter's order before knowledge of it came to the president through its publication in the new york journals the usual acrimonious comments immediately followed radicals approved it democrats and conservatives denounced it and the president was assailed for inaction on the one hand and for treachery on the other lincoln's own judgment of the act was definite and prompt no commanding general shall do such a thing upon my responsibility without consulting me he wrote in answer to a note from chase who wished to the order to stand three days later may nineteenth eighteen sixty two the president published a proclamation reciting that the government had no knowledge or part in the issuing of hunter's order of emancipation that neither hunter nor any other person had been authorized to declare free the slaves of any state and that his order in that respect was altogether void 
the president continued i further make it known that whether it be competent for me as commander-in-chief of the army and navy to declare the slaves of any state or states free and whether at any time in any case it shall have become a necessity indispensable to the maintenance of the government to exercise such a supposed power are questions which under my responsibility i reserve to myself and which i cannot feel justified in leaving to the decision of commanders in the field these are totally different questions from those of police regulations in the armies and camps while the president thus drew a sharp distinction between the limited authority of commanders in the field and the full reservoir of executive powers in his own hands for future contingencies he utilized the occasion for a forcible admonition to the border slave states reminding them that he by recommendation and congress by joint resolution had made them a formal tender and pledge of payment for their slaves if they would voluntarily abolish the institution he counselled them in words of parental wisdom and affection not to neglect this opportunity of financial security for themselves and patriotic benefit to their country he said to the people of those states i now earnestly appeal i do not argue i beseech you to make the arguments for yourselves you cannot if you would be blind to the signs of the times i beg of you a calm and enlarged consideration of them ranging if it may be far above personal and partisan politics this proposal makes common cause for a common object casting no reproaches upon any it acts not the pharisee the change it contemplates would come gently as the dews of heaven not rending or wrecking anything will you not embrace it so much good has not been done by one effort in all past time as in the providence of god it is now your high privilege to do may the vast future not have to lament that you have neglected it the signs of the times were indeed multiplying to a degree that ought to have attracted the notice of the border states even without the pointing finger of the president how far the presence of the confederate armies embodying a compact pro-slavery sentiment had up to that time interfered locally with the relations of master and slave we have no means of knowing we do know that before the end of the rebellion the conditions of war military necessity brought even the rebel government and the unconquered slave communities to the verge of emancipation and the general military employment of the blacks but northern armies embodying a compact anti-slavery sentiment stationed or moving in slave communities acted on the institution as a disturbing relaxing and disintegrating force constant in operation which no vigilance could shut out and no regulations could remedy whether in kentucky or virginia missouri or mississippi the slave gave the union soldiers his sympathy and his help while for services rendered and still more for services expected the soldiers returned friendship and protection finding no end of pretext to evade any general orders to the contrary from the army this feeling communicated itself sometimes directly to congress sometimes to the soldiers northern home from which it was in turn reflected upon that body the anti-slavery feeling at the north excited by the ten years political contention intensified by the outbreak of rebellion was thus fed and stimulated and grew with every day's duration of the war conservative opinion could not defend a system that had wrought the convulsion and disaster through which the nation was struggling radical opinion lost no opportunity to denounce it and attack its vulnerable points of the operations of this sentiment the debates and enactments of congress afford an approximate measure during the long session from december to eighteen sixty one to july seventeen eighteen sixty two the subject seemed to touch every topic at some point while the affirmative propositions of which slavery was the central and vital object were of themselves sufficiently numerous to absorb a large share of the discussions 
leaving out of view the many resolutions and bills which received only passing attention or which were at once rejected this second session of the thirty-seventh congress perfected and enacted a series of anti-slavery measures which amounted to a complete reversal of the policy of the general government at the date of the president's proclamation quoted above calling attention to the signs of the times only a portion of these measures had reached final enactment but the drift and portent of their coming was unmistakable in the restricted limits of these pages it is impossible to pass them in review separately or chronologically nor does the date of their passage and approval always indicate the relation in which they engrossed the attention of congress the consideration of the general subject was we may almost say continuous and the reader will obtain a better idea of their cumulative force and value from a generalized abstract showing the importance and scope of the several acts and sections as related to each other first one of the earliest forms of the discussion arose upon the constantly recurring question of returning the slave owners such runaways as sought the protection of the union camps and regarding which various commanders had issued such different and contradictory orders it has been stated that the president left his officers full discretion on this point because it fell within the necessities of camp and police regulations the somewhat harsh and arbitrary order number three issued by general halleck in missouri provoked widespread comment and indignation and though the general insisted that the spirit of the order was purely military and not political it undoubtedly hastened and intensified congressional action by an act approved march thirteenth eighteen sixty two a new article of war was added to the army regulations which enjoined under usual penalties that all officers or persons in the military or naval service of the united states are prohibited from employing any of the forces under their respective commands for the purpose of returning fugitives from service or labor who may have escaped etc later section ten of the confiscation act was virtually an amendment of the fugitive slave law providing that the claimant might not use its authority until he had taken an oath of allegiance and prohibiting any person in the army or navy from surrendering a fugitive slave or presuming to decide the validity of the owner's claim second no less to fulfil the dictates of propriety and justice than for its salutary influence on the opinion of foreign nations the annual message of the president had recommended a recognition of the independence and sovereignty of haiti and liberia and the appointment of diplomatic representatives to those new states this was duly authorized by an act approved june five eighteen sixty two similar reasons also secured the passage of an act to carry into effect the treaty between the united states and her britannic majesty for the suppression of the african slave trade approved july eleventh eighteen sixty two that this action betokened more than mere hollow profession and sentiment is evinced by the fact that under the prosecution of the government the slave trader nathaniel p gordon was convicted and hanged in new york on the twenty first of february eighteen sixty two this being the first execution for such crime under the laws of the united states after their enforcement had been neglected and their extreme penalty defied for forty years third the next marked feature of congressional anti-slavery enactment was one which in a period of peace would have signalized the culmination of a great party triumph and taken its place as a distinctive political landmark now however in the clash and turmoil of war it was disposed of not so much in the light of party conquest as the simple necessary registration of accomplished facts wrought beyond recall by passing events recognized by public opinion and requiring only the formality of parliamentary attestation its title was an act to secure freedom to all persons within the territories of the united states approved june nineteenth eighteen sixty two 
this was the realization of the purpose which had called the republican party into being namely the restoration of the missouri compromise its extension and application to all territories of the united states and as a logical result the rejection and condemnation of the pro-slavery doctrines of the dred scott decision the demand for a congressional slave code and the subversive property theory of jefferson davis these were the issues which had caused the six years political contention between the north and the south and upon its defeat at the ballot box by the election of president lincoln the south had appealed to the sword fourth still advancing another step in the prevalent anti-slavery progress we come to the policy of compensated emancipation so strenuously urged by the president action on this point has already been described namely the joint resolution of congress approved april tenth eighteen sixty two virtually pledging the aid of the government to any state which would adopt it and the act approved april sixteenth eighteen sixty two with its amendments actually abolishing slavery in the district of columbia with compensation to owners the earnestness of congress in this reform is marked by the additional step that under acts approved may twenty one and july eleventh eighteen sixty two certain provisions were made for the education of colored children in the cities of washington and georgetown district of columbia fifth by far the most important of all the anti-slavery laws of this period both in scope and purpose was a new confiscation act perfected after much deliberation passed at the close of the session and approved by the president july seventeenth eighteen sixty two the act of august sixth eighteen sixty one only went to the extent of making free the slaves actually employed in rebel military service the new law undertook to deal more generally with the subject and indeed extended its provisions beyond the mere idea of confiscation while other subjects were included its spirit and object would have been better expressed by the title of an act to destroy slavery under the powers of war in addition to other penalties for treason or rebellion it declared that slaves of persons guilty and convicted of these crimes should be made free that slaves of rebels escaping and taking refuge within the army lines slaves captured from rebels or deserted by them and coming under the control of the united states government and slaves of rebels found in any place occupied by rebel forces and afterwards occupied by the union army should all be deemed captives of war and be forever free sixth coupled with the foregoing sweeping provisions intended to destroy title and slave property as a punishment for treason and rebellion were other provisions which under guarded phraseology looked to the active organized employment of slaves as a substantial military force which military service should in its turn also in specified cases work in franchisement from bondage thus in certain amendments of the militia laws it was enacted that the president might enroll and employ contrabands in such camp labor or military service as they were fitted for and that their wives mothers and children if they belonged to armed rebels should become free by virtue of such service section eleven of the confiscation act however conferred a still broader authority upon the government for this object it provided that the president of the united states is authorized to employ as many persons of african descent as he may deem necessary and proper for the suppression of this rebellion and for this purpose he may organize and use them in such manner as he may judge best for the public welfare this section allowed a latitude of construction which permitted the organization of a few of the earliest regiments of colored soldiers in tracing the anti-slavery policy of president lincoln his opinions upon some of the prominent features of these laws become of special interest he followed the discussion and perfecting of the confiscation act with careful attention and as it neared its passage prepared a veto message pointing out several serious defects which congress hastily remedied in anticipation by an explanatory 
joint resolution when the bill and resolution were submitted to him he signed both as being substantially a single act and to place himself right upon the record transmitted with his notice of approval a copy of the draft of his intended veto message the constitutional objection and the imperfections of detail in the original bill do not require mention here but his views on emancipation and the military employment of slaves may not be omitted there is much in the bill to which i perceive no objection it is wholly prospective and touches neither person nor property of any loyal citizen in which particulars it is just and proper it is also provided that the slaves of persons convicted under these sections shall be free i think there is an unfortunate form of expression rather than a substantial objection in this it is startling to say that congress can free a slave within a state and yet if it were said the ownership of the slave had first been transferred to the nation and that congress had then liberated him the difficulty would at once vanish and this is the real case the traitor against the general government forfeits his slave at least as justly as he does any other property and he forfeits both to the government against which he offends the government so far as there can be ownership thus owns the forfeited slaves and the question for congress in regard to them is shall they be made free or be sold to new masters i perceive no objection to congress deciding in advance that they shall be free to the high honor of kentucky as i am informed she has been the owner of some slaves by esquite and has sold none but liberated all i hope the same is true of some other states indeed i do not believe it would be physically possible for the general government to return persons so circumstanced to actual slavery i believe there would be physical resistance to it which could neither be turned aside by argument nor driven away by force in this view i have no objection to this feature of the bill the eleventh section simply assumes to confer discretionary powers upon the executive without the law i have no hesitation to go as far in the direction indicated as i may at any time deem expedient and i am ready to say now i think it is proper for our military commanders to employ as laborers as many persons of african descent as can be used to advantage the number and variety of anti-slavery provisions cited above show how vulnerable was the peculiar institution in a state of war and demonstrate again the folly of the slaveholders appeal to arms all the penalties therein prescribed were clearly justifiable by the war powers of the nation and sustained by military necessity so far the laws had not touched a single right of a loyal slaveholder in a slave state either within or without the territory held by confederate arms but day by day it became manifest that the whole slave system was so ramified and intertwined with political and social conditions in slave states both loyal and disloyal that it must eventually stand or fall in mass in short the proof was more absolute in war than in peace that slavery was purely the creature of positive law in theory and of universal police regulations unremittingly enforced in practice it must not be supposed that the discussion and enactment of these measures proceeded without decided opposition the three factions of which congress was composed maintained the same relative position on these topics that they had occupied since the beginning of the rebellion the bulk of the resistance was furnished by the democratic members who while as a rule they condemned the rebellion reiterated their previous accusations that the republican party had provoked it now again at every anti-slavery proposition no matter how necessary or justifiable they charged that it was a violation of express or implied political faith and a stumbling-block to reconciliation which against the plainest evidences they assumed to be still possible in a hopeless minority and with no chance to effect legislation affirmatively even by indirection they yet maintained the attitude of an ill-natured opposition yielding assent only to the most necessary war measures while with 
sophistical and irritating criticism they were industriously undermining public confidence in the president and his adherents by every party and parliamentary device they could invent there is little doubt that this action of the democrats in congress in addition to its other pernicious effects served to render the border state delegations more stubborn and intractable against making any concessions toward the liberal and reformatory policy which president lincoln so strongly urged the statesmen and politicians of the border slave states were quick enough to perceive the danger to their whole slave system but not resolute enough to prepare to meet and endure its removal and accept a money equivalent in exchange against evidence and conviction they clung tenaciously to the idea that the war ought to be prosecuted without damage to slavery and their representatives and senators in congress with a very few brave exceptions resisted from first to last all anti-slavery enactments we may admit that in this course they represented truly the majority feeling and will of their several constituencies but such an admission is fatal to any claim on their part to political foresight or leadership indeed one of the noticeable and lamentable features of the earlier stages of the rebellion was the sudden loss of power among border state leaders both at home and in congress we can now see that their weakness resulted unavoidably from their defensive position during the secession stage they only ventured to act defensively against that initial heresy and as a rule the offensive and unscrupulous conspirators kept the advantage of an aggressive initiative now in the new stage of anti-slavery reaction they were again merely on the defensive and under the disadvantage which that attitude always brings with it in congress as a faction they were sadly diminished in numbers and shorn of personal prestige they could count only a single conspicuous representative the venerable john j crittenden but burdened with the weight of years and hedged by the tangles and pitfalls of his conservative obligations he was timid spiritless despondent the record of the border state delegations therefore during this strong anti-slavery movement of congressional enactment is simply one of protests excuses appeals and direful prophecies against them the positive affirmative progress of anti-slavery sentiment gathered force and volume from every quarter whatever the momentary or individual outcry it was easy to perceive that every anti-slavery speech resolution vote or law received quick sustaining acceptance from public sentiment in the north and from the fighting union armies in the south the republican majority in congress noted and responded to these symptoms of approval and the radical leaders in that body were constantly prompted by them to more advanced demands and votes anti-slavery opinion in congress not only had the advantage of overpowering numbers but also of conspicuous ability a high average talent marked the republican membership which as a rule spoke and voted for the before-mentioned anti-slavery measures while among those whose zeal gave them especial prominence in these debates the names of charles sumner in the senate and of thaddeus stevens and owen lovejoy in the house need only be mentioned to show what high qualities of zeal and talent pursued the peculiar institution with unrelenting warfare to the rebellious south to the loyal population of the border slave states and to the extreme conservatism of the north particularly that faction represented by democratic members of congress president lincoln's proposal of gradual compensated abolishment doubtless seemed a remarkable if not a dangerous innovation upon the practical politics of half a century but this conservatism failed to comprehend the mighty sweep and power of the revolution of opinion which slavery had put in motion by its needless appeal to arms in point of fact the president stood sagaciously midway between headlong reform and blind reaction his steady cautious direction and control of the average public sentiment of the country alike held back rash experiment and spurred lagging opinion congress with a strong republican majority in both branches was stirred by hot debate on the new issues the indirect influence of the executive was much greater than in times of peace a reckless president could have done infinite damage 
to the delicate structure of constitutional government as it was anti-slavery resentment was restrained and confined to such changes of legislation as were plainly necessary to vindicate the constitution laws and traditions which the rebellion had wantonly violated but these were sufficiently numerous and pointed to mark a profound transformation of public policy in little more than a year under the occasion and spur which the rebellion furnished a twelvemonth wrought that which had not been dreamed of in a decade or which would otherwise have been scarcely possible to achieve in a century four months had now elapsed since president lincoln proposed and congress sanctioned the policy of compensated emancipation in the border slave states except in its indirect influence upon public opinion no definite result had as yet attended the proposal great fluctuations had occurred in the war and great strides had been made in legislation but the tendency so far had been rather to complicate than simplify the political situation to exasperate rather than appease contending factions and conflicting opinions this condition of things while it might have endured for a while could not prolong itself indefinitely little by little the war was draining the life-blood of the republic however effectually the smoke and dust of the conflict might shut the view from the general eye or however flippantly small politicians might hide the question under the heat and invective of factional quarrel president lincoln looking to the future saw that to replenish the waste of armies and maintain a compact popular support the north must be united in a sentiment and policy affording a plain practical aim and solution both political and military the policy he decided upon was not yet ripe for announcement but the time had arrived to prepare the way for its avowal and acceptance as the next proper step in such a preparation the president on the twelfth of july eighteen sixty two again convened the border state delegations at the executive mansion and read to them the following carefully prepared second appeal to accept compensation for slaves in their respective states gentlemen after the adjournment of congress now very near i shall have no opportunity of seeing you for several months believing that you of the border states hold more power for good than any other equal number of members i feel it a duty which i cannot justifiably waive to make this appeal to you i intend no reproach or complaint when i assure you that in my opinion if you all had voted for the resolution in the gradual emancipation message of last march the war would now be substantially ended and the plan therein proposed is yet one of the most potent and swift means of ending it let the states which are in rebellion see definitely and certainly that in no event will the states you represent ever join their proposed confederacy and they cannot much longer maintain the contest but you cannot divest them of their hope to ultimately have you with them so long as you show a determination to perpetuate the institution within your own states beat them at elections as you have overwhelmingly done and nothing daunted they still claim you as their own you and i know what the lever of their power is break that lever before their faces and they can shake you no more for ever most of you have treated me with kindness and consideration and i trust you will not now think i improperly touch what is exclusively your own when for the sake of the whole country i ask can you for your states do better than to take the course i urge discarding punctilio and maxims adapted to more manageable times and looking only to the unprecedentedly stern facts of our case can you do better in any possible event you prefer that the constitutional relation of the states to the nation shall be practically restored without disturbance of the institution and if this were done my whole duty in this respect under the constitution and my oath of office would be performed but it is not done and we are trying to accomplish it by war the incidents of the war cannot be avoided 
if the war continues long as it must if the object be not sooner attained the institution in your states will be extinguished by mere friction and abrasion by the mere incidents of the war it will be gone and you will have nothing valuable in lieu of it much of its value is gone already how much better for you and for your people to take the step which at once shortens the war and secures substantial compensation for that which is sure to be wholly lost in any other event how much better to thus save the money which else we sink forever in the war how much better to do it while we can lest the war ere long render us pecuniarily unable to do it how much better for you as seller and the nation as buyer to sell out and buy out that without which the war could never have been than to sink both the thing to be sold and the price of it in cutting one another's throats i do not speak of emancipation at once but of a decision at once to emancipate gradually room in south america for colonization can be obtained cheaply and in abundance and when numbers shall be large enough to be company and encouragement for one another the freed people will not be so reluctant to go i am pressed with a difficulty not yet mentioned one which threatens division among those who united are none too strong an instance of it is known to you general hunter is an honest man he was and i hope still is my friend i valued him none the less for his agreeing with me in the general wish that all men everywhere could be free he proclaimed all men free within certain states and i repudiated the proclamation he expected more good and less harm from the measure than i could believe would follow yet in repudiating it i gave dissatisfaction if not offence to many whose support the country cannot afford to lose and this is not the end of it the pressure in this direction is still upon me and is increasing by conceding what i now ask you can relieve me and much more can relieve the country in this important point upon these considerations i have again begged your attention to the message of march last before leaving the capital consider and discuss it among yourselves you are patriots and statesmen and as such i pray you consider this proposition and at the least commend it to the consideration of your states and people as you would perpetuate popular government for the best people in the world i beseech you that you do in no wise omit this our common country is in great peril demanding the loftiest views and boldest action to bring it speedy relief once relieved its form of government is saved to the world its beloved history and cherished memories are vindicated and its happy future fully assured and rendered inconceivably grand to you more than to any others the privilege is given to assure that happiness and swell that grandeur and to link your own names therewith for ever it is doubtful whether the president expected any more satisfactory result from this last appeal to the border state representatives than had attended his previous one he had had abundant occasion to observe their course in the congressional debates the opportunity had been long before them and they had not taken advantage of it amid the revolutionary impulse and action which were moving the whole country their inaction on this subject was equivalent to resistance this effort therefore like the former one proved barren most of them answered with a qualified refusal twenty of them signed a written reply on july fourteen which while it pledged an unchangeable continuance of their loyalty set forth a number of mixed and inconsequential reasons against adopting the president's recommendation they thought the project too expensive they said slavery was a right which they ought not to be asked to relinquish that the proposition had never been offered them in a tangible shape that a different policy had been announced at the beginning of the war that radical doctrines had been proclaimed and subversive measures proposed in congress in short it was a general plea for non-action seven others of their number drew up an address dissenting from the conservative views of the majority and promising that we will so far as may be in our power ask the people of the border states calmly deliberately and fairly to consider your recommendations two others wrote separate replies in the same spirit but with only a minority to urge the proposition upon their people it was plain from the first 
that no hope of success could be entertained end of chapter five chapter six of abraham lincoln a history volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume six by john hay and john george nicolay chapter six emancipation proposed and postponed military events underwent great fluctuations in the first half of the year eighteen sixty two during the first three months union victories followed each other with a rapidity and decisiveness which inspired the most sanguine hopes for the early and complete suppression of the rebellion cheering news of important successes came from all quarters mill springs in kentucky roanoke island in north carolina forts henry and donelson in tennessee pea ridge in arkansas shiloh in tennessee island number ten in the mississippi river the reduction of forts jackson and st philip on the lower mississippi the capture of new orleans in louisiana and finally what seemed the beginning of a victorious advance by mcclellan's army upon richmond in the month of may however this tide of success began to change stonewall jackson's raid initiated a series of discouraging union reverses and mcclellan's formidable advance gradually changed into an unnecessary retreat no one noted this blighting of a longed-for fruition with a keener watchfulness and more sensitive suffering than did president lincoln as the military interest and expectancy gradually lessened at the circumference and slowly centred itself upon the fatal circles around the rebel capital his thoughts by day and anxiety by night fed upon the intelligence which the telegraph brought from the union camps on the chickahominy and the james it is safe to say that no general in the army studied his maps and scanned his telegrams with half the industry and it may be added with half the intelligence which mr lincoln gave to his it is not surprising therefore that before the catastrophe finally came the president was already convinced of the substantial failure of mcclellan's campaign as first projected though he still framed his letters and telegrams in the most hopeful and encouraging language that the situation would admit but aware of the impending danger he took steps to secure such a reinforcement of the army and provide for such a readjustment of the campaign as might yet secure the final and complete victory which had lain so temptingly within mcclellan's grasp a part of this programme was the consolidation of an army under pope the culmination of disaster doubtless came sooner than he thought possible mcclellan himself did not seem apprehensive of sudden danger when on june twenty sixth he telegraphed the case is perhaps a difficult one but i shall resort to desperate measures and will do my best to outmanoeuvre outwit and outfight the enemy do not believe reports of disaster and do not be discouraged if you learn that my communications are cut off and even yorktown in possession of the enemy hope for the best and i will not deceive the hopes you formerly placed in me this was the language of a man still possessing courage and faith but the events of the two days following robbed him of both early on the morning of the twenty eighth he sent the secretary of war his memorable telegram already quoted which was a mere blind cry of despair and insubordination i have not a man in reserve and shall be glad to cover my retreat and save the material and personnel of the army if i save this army now i tell you plainly that i owe no thanks to you or to any other persons in washington you have done your best to sacrifice this army 
the kind and patient words with which president lincoln replied to this unsoldierly and unmanly petulance and the vigorous exertions put forth by the war department to mitigate the danger with all available supplies and reinforcements have been related the incident is repeated here to show that the president and cabinet promptly put into execution a measure which had probably been already debated during the preceding days the needs of the hour and lincoln's plan to provide for them cannot be more briefly stated than in the two letters which follow the first of which written on this twenty eighth day of june he addressed to his secretary of state it was evidently written in a moment of profound emotion produced by mcclellan's telegram for nowhere in all his utterances is there to be found a stronger announcement of his determination to persevere unfalteringly in the public and patriotic task before him my view of the present condition of the war is about as follows the evacuation of corinth and our delay by the flood in the chickahominy have enabled the enemy to concentrate too much force in richmond for mcclellan to successfully attack in fact there soon will be no substantial rebel force anywhere else but if we send all the force from here to mcclellan the enemy will before we can know of it send a force from richmond and take washington or if a large part of the western army be brought here to mcclellan they will let us have richmond and retake tennessee kentucky missouri etc what should be done is to hold what we have in the west open the mississippi and take chattanooga and east tennessee without more a reasonable force should in every event be kept about washington for its protection then let the country give us a hundred thousand new troops in the shortest possible time which added to mcclellan directly or indirectly will take richmond without endangering any other place which we now hold and will substantially end the war i expect to maintain this contest until successful or till i die or am conquered or my term expires or congress or the country forsakes me and i would publicly appeal to the country for this new force were it not that i fear a general panic and stampede would follow so hard is it to have a thing understood as it really is i think the new force should be all or nearly all infantry principally because such can be raised most cheaply and quickly this letter was of course not needed for the personal information of mr seward but was placed in his hands to enable him to reassure those who might doubt the president's courage and determination the other letter written in advance and dated the thirtieth was addressed to the governors of the loyal states it ran as follows the capture of new orleans norfolk and corinth by the national forces has enabled the insurgents to concentrate a large force at and about richmond which place we must take with the least possible delay in fact there will soon be no formidable insurgent force except at richmond with so large an army there the enemy can threaten us on the potomac and elsewhere until we have re-established the national authority all these places must be held and we must keep a respectable force in front of washington but this from the diminished strength of our army by sickness and casualties renders an addition to it necessary in order to close the struggle which has been prosecuted for the last three months with energy and success rather than hazard the misapprehension of our military condition and of groundless alarm by a call for troops by proclamation i have deemed it best to address you in this form to accomplish the object stated we require without delay one hundred and fifty thousand men including those recently called for by the secretary of war thus reinforced our gallant army will be enabled to realize the hopes and expectations of the government and the people 
armed with these letters mr seward proceeded hastily to new york city the brief correspondence which ensued indicates the progressive steps and success of his mission on this same thirtieth of june he telegraphed to secretary stanton am getting a foundation for an increase of one hundred and fifty thousand shall have an important step to communicate to-night or to-morrow morning governors morgan and curtin here and communicate with others by telegraph let me have reliable information when convenient as it steadies my operations will you authorize me to promise an advance to recruits of twenty five dollars of the one hundred dollars bounty it is thought here and in massachusetts that without such payment recruiting will be very difficult and with it probably entirely successful to this the secretary of war replied on the following day the existing law does not authorize an advance of the bounty discreet persons here suggest that the call should be for three hundred thousand men double the number you propose as the waste will be large consider the matter the president has not come into town yet when he arrives you will receive his answer later in the day he added to the above the president approves your plan but suggests two hundred thousand if it can be done as well as the number you mention it is probable that a further discussion and perhaps also further information of the retreat and despondency on the peninsula brought more fully to the minds of the president and secretary of war the gravity of the crisis and the need of decisive action for mr stanton sent a third telegram to mr seward saying your telegram received i will take the responsibility of ordering the twenty five dollars bounty out of the nine millions appropriation at all hazards and you may go on that basis i will make and telegraph the order in an hour the president's answer has already gone mr seward's answer to this was all that could be desired under the circumstances the governors respond and the union committee approve earnestly and unanimously let the president make the order and let both papers come out in to-morrow morning's papers if possible the number of troops to be called is left to the president to fix no one proposes less than two hundred thousand make it three hundred thousand if you wish they say it may be five hundred thousand if the president desires get the twenty five dollars advance fixed and let the terms be made known accordingly on the morning of july two there appeared in the newspapers a formal correspondence purporting to be the voluntary request of eighteen governors of loyal states to the president that you at once call upon the several states for such numbers of men as may be required to fill up all military organizations now in the field and add to the army heretofore organized such additional numbers of men as may in your judgment be necessary to garrison and hold all of the numerous cities and military positions that have been captured by our armies all believe that the decisive moment is near at hand and to that end the people of the united states are desirous to aid promptly in furnishing all reinforcements that you may deem needful to sustain our government to which the president's reply announced gentlemen fully concurring in the wisdom of the views expressed to me in so patriotic a manner by you in the communication of the twenty eighth day of june i have decided to call into the service an additional force of three hundred thousand men it was thought safest to mark high enough said mr lincoln in a private telegram to governor morgan of new york while in another private circular to all the governors he explained his desire a little more fully i should not want the half of three hundred thousand new troops if i could have them now if i had fifty thousand additional troops here now i believe i could substantially close the war in two weeks but time is everything and if i get fifty thousand new men in a month i shall have lost twenty thousand old ones during the same month having gained only thirty thousand with the difference between old and new troops still against me the quicker you send the fewer you will have to send time is everything 
please act in view of this the enemy having given up corinth it is not wonderful that he is thereby enabled to check us for a time at richmond it was doubtless the sudden collapse of mcclellan's richmond campaign which brought president lincoln to the determination to adopt his policy of general military emancipation much sooner than he would otherwise have done the necessity of a comprehensive rearrangement of military affairs was upon him and it was but natural that it should involve a revision of political policy the immediate present was provided for in the call just issued for three hundred thousand volunteers but he had learned by experience that he must count new possibilities of delays and defeats and that his determination so recently recorded to maintain this contest to ultimate triumph compelled him to open new sources of military strength he recognized and had often declared that in a republic the talisman which wrought the wonders of statesmanship and the changes of national destiny was public opinion we now know that in the use of this talisman he was the most consummate master whose skill history has recorded we are justified in the inference that his foresight had perceived and estimated the great and decisive element of military strength which lay as yet untouched and unappropriated in the slave population of the south to its use however there existed two great obstacles prejudice on the part of the whites the want of a motive on the part of the blacks his problem was to remove the one and to supply the other for the first of these difficulties the time was specially propitious in one respect in the momentary check and embarrassment of all the armies of the union generals soldiers and conservative politicians would tolerate reprisal upon rebels with forbearance if not with favor and for their consent to the full military employment of the blacks he might trust to the further change of popular sentiment the drift of which was already so manifest the motive which would call the slaves to the active help of the union armies lay ready made for his use indeed it had been in steadily increasing action from the beginning of hostilities till now as far and as effectively as the government would permit mcclellan's change of base was effected on the first of july eighteen sixty two lincoln's final appeal to the border states took place shortly afterwards on july twelve and his vivid portrayal of the inevitable wreck of slavery in the stress of war doubtless gathered color and force from the recent military events already before the border state delegations gave him their written replies he knew from their words and bearing that they would in effect refuse the generous tender of compensation and he decided in his own mind that he would at an early day give notice of his intention to emancipate the slaves of rebellious states by military proclamation his first confidential announcement of the new departure occurred on the day following his interview with the border state representatives and is thus recorded in the diary of secretary wells on sunday the thirteenth of july eighteen sixty two president lincoln invited me to accompany him in his carriage to the funeral of an infant child of mr stanton secretary seward and mrs frederick seward were also in the carriage mr stanton occupied at that time for a summer residence the house of a naval officer some two or three miles west or northwesterly of georgetown it was on this occasion and on this ride that he first mentioned to mr seward and myself the subject of emancipating the slaves by proclamation in case the rebels did not cease to persist in their war on the government and the union of which he saw no evidence he dwelt earnestly on the gravity importance and delicacy of the movement said he had given it much thought and had about come to the conclusion that it was a military necessity absolutely essential for the salvation of the nation that we must free the slaves or be ourselves subdued etc etc 
this was he said the first occasion where he had mentioned the subject to any one and wished us to frankly state how the proposition struck us mr seward said the subject involved consequences so vast and momentous that he should wish to bestow on it mature reflection before giving a decisive answer but his present opinion inclined to the measure as justifiable and perhaps he might say expedient and necessary these were also my views two or three times on that ride the subject which was of course an absorbing one for each and all was adverted to and before separating the president desired us to give the subject special and deliberate attention for he was earnest in the conviction that something must be done it was a new departure for the president for until this time in all our previous interviews whenever the question of emancipation or the mitigation of slavery had been in any way alluded to he had been prompt and emphatic in denouncing any interference by the general government with the subject this was i think the sentiment of every member of the cabinet all of whom including the president considered it a local domestic question appertaining to the states respectively who had never parted with their authority over it but the reverses before richmond and the formidable power and dimensions of the insurrection which extended through all the slave states and had combined most of them in a confederacy to destroy the union impelled the administration to, to adopt extraordinary measures to preserve the national existence the slaves if not armed and disciplined were in the service of those who were not only as field labourers and producers but thousands of them were in attendance upon the armies in the field employed as waiters and teamsters and the fortifications and entrenchments were constructed by them within the next four days congress finished its business and adjourned the confiscation act being an important part of its final work the president as we have seen signed the bill with its amendatory resolution and the government was thus brought face to face with the practical duty of enforcing its provisions through military directions and orders in further detail it has been explained how the confiscation act and other laws broadened and multiplied the forfeitures of title to slaves for the crimes of treason and rebellion we have the evidence of the president's written comments that he considered these penalties just and the imposition of them constitutional in the administration of the laws thus enacted there therefore remained to be examined only the convenience of their practical enforcement and the general effect upon public opinion of the policy they established we have no record of the specific reasoning of president lincoln upon these points we only know that within the five days following the adjournment of congress july seventeen to july twenty two eighteen sixty two his mind reached its final conclusions the diary of secretary chase contains the following record of what occurred at the cabinet meeting at the executive mansion on july twenty one i went at the appointed hour and found that the president had been profoundly concerned at the present aspect of affairs and had determined to take some definite steps in respect to military action and slavery he had prepared several orders the first of which contemplated authority to commanders to subsist their troops in the hostile territory the second authority to employ negroes as laborers the third requiring that both in the case of property taken and of negroes employed accounts should be kept with such degrees of certainty as would enable compensation to be made in proper cases another provided for the colonization of negroes in some tropical country a good deal of discussion took place upon these points the first order was universally approved the second was approved entirely and the third by all except myself i doubted the expediency of attempting to keep accounts for the benefit of the inhabitants of rebel states the colonization project was not much discussed the secretary of war presented some letters from general hunter in which he advised the department that the withdrawal of a large proportion of his troops to reinforce general mcclellan 
rendered it highly important that he should be immediately authorized to enlist all loyal persons without reference to complexion messrs stanton seward and myself expressed ourselves in favour of this plan and no one expressed himself against it mr blair was not present the president was not prepared to decide the question but expressed himself as averse to arming negroes this cabinet discussion came to no final conclusion and we learn from the same diary that on the following day tuesday july twenty two eighteen sixty two which was regular cabinet day the subject was resumed further conference was had on organizing negro regiments but lincoln decided that the moment had not yet arrived when this policy could be safely entered upon secretary chase wrote the impression left upon my mind by the whole discussion was that while the president thought that the organization equipment and arming of negroes like other soldiers would be productive of more evil than good he was not unwilling that commanders should at their discretion arm for purely defensive purposes slaves coming within their lines but on the kindred policy of emancipation the president had reached a decision which appears to have been in advance of the views of his entire cabinet probably greatly to their surprise he read to them the following draft of a proclamation warning the rebels of the pains and penalties of the confiscation act and while renewing his tender of compensation to loyal states which would adopt gradual abolishment adding a summary military order as commander-in-chief declaring free the slaves of all states which might be in rebellion on january one eighteen sixty three the text of this first draft of the emancipation proclamation is here printed from the president's autograph manuscript in pursuance of the sixth section of the act of congress entitled an act to suppress insurrection and to punish treason and rebellion to seize and confiscate property of rebels and for other purposes approved july seventeenth eighteen sixty two and which act and the joint resolution explanatory thereof are herewith published i abraham lincoln president of the united states do hereby proclaim to and warn all persons within the contemplation of said sixth section to cease participating in aiding countenancing or abetting the existing rebellion or any rebellion against the government of the united states and to return to their proper allegiance to the united states on pain of the forfeitures and seizures as within and by said sixth section provided and i hereby make known that it is my purpose upon the next meeting of congress to again recommend the adoption of a practical measure for tendering pecuniary aid to the free choice or rejection of any and all states which may then be recognizing and practically sustaining the authority of the united states and which may then have voluntarily adopted or thereafter may voluntarily adopt gradual abolishment of slavery within such state or states that the object is to practically restore thenceforward to be maintained the constitutional relation between the general government and each and all the states wherein that relation is now suspended or disturbed and that for this object the war as it has been will be prosecuted and as a fit and necessary military measure for effecting this object i as commander-in-chief of the army and navy of the united states do order and declare that on the first day of january in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and sixty three all persons held as slaves within any state or states wherein the constitutional authority of the united states shall not then be practically recognized submitted to and maintained shall then thenceforward and for ever be free of the cabinet proceedings which followed the reading of this momentous document we have unfortunately only very brief memoranda every member of the council was we may infer bewildered by the magnitude and boldness of the proposal the sudden consideration of this critical question reveals to us with vividness the difference in mental reach readiness and decision between the president and his constitutional advisers only two of the number gave the measure their unreserved concurrence even after discussion 
it is strange that one of these was the cautious attorney-general the representative of the conservative faction of the slave-holding state of missouri and that the member who opposed the measure as a whole and proposed to achieve the result indirectly through the scattered and divided action of local commanders in military departments was the anti-slavery secretary of the treasury mr chase representing perhaps more nearly than any other the abolition faction of the free state of ohio all were astonished except the two to whom it had been mentioned a week before none of the others had even considered such a step but from the mind and will of president lincoln the determination and announcement to his cabinet came almost as complete in form and certain in intention on that memorable tuesday of july as when two months later it was given to the public or as officially proclaimed on the succeeding new year's day an irrevocable executive act a fragmentary memorandum in the handwriting of secretary stanton shows us distinctly the effect produced upon the assembled council the manuscript is here reproduced as nearly as the types conveniently permit the very form of the record shows the secretary's strong emotion and interest in the discussion tuesday july twenty two the president proposes to issue an order declaring that all slaves and states in rebellion on the certain day of certain year the attorney-general and stanton are for its immediate promulgation seward against it argues strongly in favor of cotton and foreign governments chase silent wells seward argues that foreign nations will intervene to prevent the abolition of slavery for sake of cotton argues in a long speech against its immediate promulgation wants to wait for troops wants halleck here wants drum and fife and public spirit we break up our relations with foreign nations and the production of cotton for sixty years chase thinks it a measure of great danger and would lead to universal emancipation the measure goes beyond anything i have recommended the omissions in this bit of historical manuscript are exceedingly provoking but some of them are supplied by president lincoln's own narrative recorded and published by the artist f b carpenter whose application for permission to paint his historical picture of the signing of the emancipation proclamation called it forth it had got to be said he mr lincoln midsummer eighteen sixty two things had gone on from bad to worse until i felt that we had reached the end of our rope on the plan of operations we had been pursuing that we had about played our last card and must change our tactics or lose the game i now determined upon the adoption of the emancipation policy and without consultation with or the knowledge of the cabinet i prepared the original draft of the proclamation and after much anxious thought called a cabinet meeting upon the subject all were present excepting mr blair the postmaster-general who was absent at the opening of the discussion but came in subsequently i said to the cabinet that i had resolved upon this step and had not called them together to ask their advice but to lay the subject matter of a proclamation before them suggestions as to which would be in order after they had heard it read mr lovejoy was in error when he informed you that it excited no comment excepting on the part of secretary seward various suggestions were offered at this point we interrupt the president's relation a moment to quote in its proper sequence the exact comment offered by secretary chase as recorded in his diary i chase said that i should give to such a measure my cordial support but i should prefer that no new expression on the subject of compensation should be made and i thought that the measure of emancipation could be much better and more quietly accomplished by allowing generals to organize and arm the slaves thus avoiding depredation and massacre on one hand and support to the insurrection on the other and by directing the commanders of departments to proclaim emancipation within their districts as soon as practicable but i regarded this as so much better than inaction on the subject that i should give it my entire support the president continues mr blair after he came in deprecated the policy on the ground that it would cost the administration the fall elections nothing however was offered that i had not already fully anticipated and settled in my own mind until secretary seward spoke 
he said in substance mr president i approve of the proclamation but i question the expediency of its issue at this juncture the depression of the public mind consequent upon our repeated reverses is so great that i fear the effect of so important a step it may be viewed as the last measure of an exhausted government a cry for help the government stretching forth its hands to ethiopia instead of ethiopia stretching forth her hands to the government his idea said the president was that it would be consider our last shriek on the retreat this was his precise expression now continued mr seward while i approve the measure i suggest sir that you postpone its issue until you can give it to the country supported by military success instead of issuing it as would be the case now upon the greatest disasters of the war mr lincoln continued the wisdom of the view of the secretary of state struck me with very great force it was an aspect of the case that in all my thought upon the subject i had entirely overlooked the result was that i put the draft of the proclamation aside as you do your sketch for a picture waiting for victory instead of the proclamation thus laid away a short one was issued three days after simply containing the warning required by the sixth section of the confiscation act the already quoted military order to make seizures under the act had been issued on the day when the proclamation was discussed and postponed meanwhile the government by its new military arrangements sending reinforcements to mcclellan organizing a new army under pope and calling halleck from the west to exercise a superior and guiding control over a combined campaign towards richmond seemed to have provided the needful requirements for early and substantial success End of chapter six